On the con side, we have Ralph Cavana. Ralph, who is quoted as saying he has the best job in the environmental sector, I believe I've heard that before, is co-director of the Energy Program at Natural Resources Defense Council. He's also served as a member of the U.S. Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board and has been a visiting professor of law at both Stanford and UC Berkeley. He has been a scholar of and leading champion for renewables and energy efficiency. First, let's be clear about one thing. Uh, Peter Schwartz is the most compelling single proponent of nuclear power in the entire universe. And I thought he made a valiant effort today. <laughs> and this will be one of the few occasions when I am going to follow someone who speaks even faster than I do. But this is a room full of people who are used to fast-talking salesmen who arrive with the best technology on Earth and only if you will only come up with a few more, in his case, hundreds of billions of dollars, he will solve the world's economic and environmental problems with it. What everyone in this room, I think, knows is that the world of clean technology procurement doesn't work quite that way at this scale. And that's the most important thing I'm going to have to tell you about, in addition to six words with which I will close my presentation that represent the strongest possible rebuttal of what Peter has told you from someone other than me, whose identity I think will interest you. But I want to say a couple of things, first of all, about Peter himself. Uh, Peter and I, uh, as uh, Ron mentioned last, had this debate five years ago at the Herbst Theater in uh, San Francisco, and the moderator was uh, Stuart Brand, who many in this room revere along with me. And afterward, Stuart wrote a book in which he basically adopted Peter's position completely in every respect, and I read through it and was slightly crushed. But there was one passage that I want to read to you that expresses something important that I want to say about the disagreement Peter and I are having, and it's a dis disagreement in this room, I, I suspect, although clearly Peter's got uh, the majority on his side at the moment. What Stewart did was he said, you know, the, in the world of people who care about clean technology and environment, there are now two camps and soon maybe more camps. He called one the Greens and one the Turquoises. Uh, I'm a Green and Peter, as suggested by his choice of shirt today, is a turquoise. But here's what, here's what Stewart said about that. He said, you know, the Greens and the turquoises, they're going to differ over nuclear power. They can divide up what there is to be done outside of nuclear power, and they can still be overworked and overwhelmed. If they maintain an ongoing mutually respectful debate, that will help each camp critique the other's projects usefully, and they'll also know when to collaborate for focused effectiveness. If they define themselves in partisan opposition to each other, then all is lost. And I think Stewart is absolutely right about that. And I'm now going to spend a few minutes critiquing one of uh, my friend Peter's projects, but also suggesting some areas for focused collaboration. Now, on the issue of why I still respectfully differ with Peter, who has come to you preaching basically the gospel of nuclear renaissance, uh, he and I have been at this for a long time. I started shortly after. Chevy Chase said that about Jane Curtin. And over the 31 years that I've been doing this, I, I believe I've lived through at least five nuclear renaissances, moments at which exciting new nuclear technologies had us poised on the verge of a brave new era. And I actually co-authored one of the reports about what was needed to make the nuclear renaissance work. This, this thing I'm holding in my hand was, it started out at the very end of the Reagan administration, and we were commissioned, there was a, a group of us commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences to define what it would take to launch the next nuclear renaissance. Now, the committee was 18 nuclear fanatics and me. Uh, the 18 nuclear fanatics were not nearly as compelling in public as Peter, but he would readily acknowledge that each and every one of them was as passionately committed as he. And I went along for the ride because I thought it would be interesting to define a world in which nuclear power could succeed. We basically told the nuclear industry they needed to do three big things. Uh, and I didn't think any of the three were possible. In fact, the nuclear industry pulled off two of the three. The first was you've got to dramatic, this is 20 years ago, remember, this is, this is when these recommendations came out, 20 years ago. We said, first, you've got to dramatically improve your safety and operational culture. At the time, the average nuclear plant was running at a capacity factor of about 60 percent. There was a lot of sloppiness. There were terrible relationships with the safety regulators. The nuclear industry cleaned up its act. You need to hear me say that. They got the capacity factors over 90 percent, safety culture dramatically better, internal controls that are now being used as the model for what the offshore oil industry needs to do to clean up its act. And I'm glad to see that. We also told them they had a tremendous amount to do to shore up their legislative and regulatory position. 
They created the most effective lobbying entity in all of Washington. If we could do what they did, we being the efficiency and renewable side, then all of Dan Riker's aspirations from this morning would have been reached already. They got a, a, a wonderful thicket of operating subsidies, construction subsidies, subsidies for possible delays in regulatory uh, action. They got, they got immunity from uh, catastrophic accidents. They got a much more uh, effective r relationship with their regulators. They did all of that. But we told them there was one other thing they had to do. That in a utility industry, increasingly marked by a competitive procurement model, where the old monopolies were falling away, the old monopolies that had nurtured the first generation of nuclear plants had still generated costly cancellations, we told them they had to, to create a competitive product for that new competitive procurement system that we predicted would come to dominate the U.S. utility industry and ultimately the world industry. And I think we were right about that, and that is where the signal failure has been and remains. Again, in the 20 years since, how many nuclear plants successfully moved through competitive procurement? None. When was the last nuclear plant actually ordered and built? 1973. In a commentary from late 2010 called Honey, I Shrunk the Renaissance, regulator Peter Bradford, who knows as much about nuclear energy as anyone on Earth, looked at the competitive performance of nuclear power, uh, pointed out that as far as he could tell, in relative terms, with all of the competitors capable of meeting the economic and environmental challenges that Peter and I care passionately about, and I will yield nothing to him in how much I care about uh, global climate and the urgency of suspending this uniquely dangerous experiment we're all conducting with it. And if the choice really were coal versus nuclear, I'd be there with Peter. But everyone in this room knows there are many other choices. What Bradford said in thinking about the competitive procurement world of utilities and where nuclear fit, the analogy he used that I thought was in some ways apt was he said, you know, the urgency of world hunger does not compel us to fight back with caviar, no matter how nourishing fish eggs may be. And what's imperfect about the analogy is that caviar at least can be acquired relatively quickly and served in small doses. The fundamental problem with the nuclear reactors now on the market and being offered in competitive procurement is precisely that they are so big, that they, say they take so long to build, that they are so relatively inflexible in operation. They are designed as giant 24-7 city-sized power supplies, remote from population centers, the antithesis of everything you've been told today about what we're trying to accomplish with the smart grid. And yet, and yet what is most important to know is Peter has confidence about the prospects of nuclear in a world of competitive procurement. I have no confidence. Neither of us is going to be the decision maker. The decision makers will be the utilities that collectively across North America and the world are the most important investors in clean technology, as everyone here knows. The issue is, can nuclear make its case against the most formidable competition we've ever seen? And this is, in many ways, I think, a good news story. Not just, I don't think Peter and I can begin in the short time we have available to do justice to all the competitors, but they come in and present to all of you all the time. You know how rich the efficiency, renewables, efficient natural gas, and a whole host of other options really are. All the integration solutions to make sure that the intermittent resources can meld with the others. The very concept of baseload generation, which drives much of the nuclear enthusiasm, is almost certainly obsolete today, as Peter might agree, and even more important, the chair of the current Federal Energy Regulatory Commission agrees. But where we can agree, and this is the note on which I want to close, is that we all, wherever our relative level of enthusiasm is for nuclear power, we need a functioning system of long-term resource procurement. We need the utilities and power to go out and invest, make long-term decisions. I'm with Peter. I want them to be able to make 10, 20-year commitments to the best options available that come through competitive procurement. I don't want the world energy markets to run solely on spot markets. And that model of long-term utility procurement is very much under challenge today in the United United States and worldwide. We need today to shore it up together. We need to be before those public utility commissions, which are in unlovely places, remote places across the United States and North America, making the case for more clean technology investment and ensuring that it does not shut down. As we make that case, my fundamental reason for optimism that other better alternatives will prevail is summed up in the six words that I promised to provide, which were reported in the New York Times at a conference convened in December 2010 by the Idaho National Engineering Lab, which has the strongest rooting interest in nuclear power imaginable. 
The quote is from the chief nuclear officer of the Exelon Corporation, who runs the biggest nuclear fleet in North America and does it better than anyone else on Earth. And on the prospects for new nuclear plants to be ordered by Exelon through competitive procurement, he said this, we just can't make the numbers work. Thank you. Ralph, we're going to have to wrap up now. So since Peter went first, I'd like you to go first now in your one-minute summary on your argument. Peter has erected a world in which, as he said, every dollar I don't spend on a nuclear plant will go to a coal plant. And if you think that's the world, you vote with Peter. But nobody in this room can possibly think that's the world. You know two things. You know that there is a limited amount of capital available to solve our energy and climate problems, and that there is an urgent need to pick a portfolio in which the winners and losers emerge on the merits in terms of cost, scale, and risk. And it's going to be diverse, and it is going to draw on all the genius and innovation represented in this room and Peter's bringing you the same old stuff we saw in 1990 and that really had its origins in the monopoly world of the 50s and 60s. We can do better. Yeah.